All right, shall we get started? All right, can you hear me? Shall we get started? How are you, everyone? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Wayne Allen Root. Let me, uh, let me start with some good news. Well, actually, let me start. If there's, uh, first of all, show of hands. So most of you know who I am, or some of you are not familiar. Raise your hand if you're not familiar. Okay. So I'm a Fox News guy, Fox News guest. Uh, I'm a Columbia University graduate, class of 83, Barack Obama's college classmate. Uh, not a friend of Barack, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but, but one of my claim to faves. I've been in the media, as a matter of fact, all week this week at Fox News, at Blaze, at all the big conservative sites, at Newsmax, Newsmax TV, because I was the wonderful, uh, happy recipient of an Obama IRS attack. If you saw that article uh, in conservative media all over the country, I'm that guy, Wayne Root, who uh, spent a lot of time in the media, 7,000 interviews in the last six years on conservative talk radio, Fox News bashing Obama and predicting exactly what would happen to the economy, exactly what's happening if you let a socialist take over the United States. And it's happened. And of course, he doesn't like when you say that. And I wound up with an over-the-top IRS attack, you know, $100,000 in legal fees. And when it was over and I won, five days later, new IRS audit. Something no one has ever heard of, tax lawyers in the history of America. When that was finally over, Judicial Watch took my case, the number one government watchdog in the country that uh, literally believed it was a case of government targeting and, uh, and government persecution because of my political views. And we filed with the IRS to get my tax returns and uh, under the Freedom of Information Act. And by law, uh, the government had 30 days to turn them over. By law, it took 14 months of a vicious battle to get the tax returns. I finally got them as of a month ago. And that's what I've been writing about in the media. We have in our hands and written all over them and typed all over them are my political views written by the IRS agents and how they hated me because I'm a Fox News guy and hated me because I'm an anti-Obama guy. And written on them is that a Democratic United States senator initiated the investigation against me, which makes it criminal targeting. And so now I've got all of my files in front of the United States Senate Committee investigating the IRS scandal, and I'll be testifying in front of it. And, and as, as a matter of fact, as of a week from today, next Thursday, I'll be meeting with the United States Investigator General, who oversees the Internal Revenue Service, who saw my article, called me and said, I want you in right away, and let's talk about it. So it's just an amazing situation. And by the way, the other big smoking gun, there's a few of them, but I'm sure that this government would say that nobody ever gets persecuted for their political views. And Wayne Root was just a simple, random audit, except written on my, on my tax files, sensitive case. Can you imagine sensitive case? My lawyer said, unless you're the brother-in-law of the commissioner of the IRS, there isn't any reason why the word sensitive case would be on your case. They meant politically sensitive. And then finally, the case ended when one of the top IRS officials in America made a call to my auditor and said, kill the case today. I want it ended. And we now found out after the fact that day was May 23rd, 2013, the very day Lois Lerner was suspended from the IRS. So we now believe she was the one who was in charge of my case. They probably went in the office and said, this woman's going to get us all put in prison. Let's kill every case, let's distance ourselves and get rid of them. And that's how my case finally ended, or I'd probably be under IRS audit again today and it never would end it. So amazing story. Listen, despite all that, despite the negativity of all that, those of you who really know me know I'm a very positive guy. Uh, I'm kind of the smiling face of the Tea Party movement, a uh, very enthusiastic guy. Uh, I want to tell you a funny story to start today's festivities that kind of sums up my philosophy in life so you know you're in the right place because we're going to have some fun today. Um, and this story is about an elderly man who walks into a church and he says, I want to confess. And the priest takes him in the confession booth and he says, you know, I'm 92 years old and I've got children, I've got grandchildren, I have great grandchildren and I've been blessed. My wife passed away a few years ago but I've had a wonderful, wonderful life. And the priest says, why are you here? And the old man says, well, yesterday I was driving and I picked up two beautiful young girls who were hitchhiking and I took them back to my house and I made love to them, both of them, all night long. And the priest says, are you sorry for your sins? And the old man says, heck no, it was the best night of my entire life. And the priest says, what kind of Catholic are you? And the old man says, I'm not a Catholic. And the priest says, then why are you telling me this story? And the old man says, because I'm telling everyone. <laughs> And that kind of sums up my life, because I'm an enthusiastic guy. I always look for the glass being half 
full, not half empty. I believe enthusiasm is what creates success in life. Faith in you, faith in your talents, faith in God. Those are the things that I think matter. And I've been blessed in life and I have four beautiful children ranging in age between seven and 23. And the 23 year old, a conservative, just graduated magna cum laude from Harvard University. So I've been blessed. And she was a homeschooler who had never been in a classroom in her life till the day she was accepted by Harvard, Stanford, Columbia, Penn, Brown, Duke, Chicago, Cal Berkeley, and early admittance to Yale University, 12 for 12 of the best colleges in the United States. So I think mom and dad did a good job. So I think it'll all be okay. I think we're gonna be okay despite some of the negative things that I'll tell you about today. Here's proof that you need to be relentlessly optimistic. Duke University did a study, it was actually Duke Business School, and the researchers studied 3,000 CEOs and what did they find was the one thing they most had in common. By far, optimism. Over the top optimism. They rated 80% from the study very optimistic. 80% far, far higher than the average person. And they were not only more upbeat about business, they were more upbeat about life. And when they asked the 3,000 CFOs, chief financial officers, about their CEOs, the CFOs said they are so much more positive than me, it's off the charts. And that's why they are CEOs. That's why they got where they got. Now the result of that is there was a second thing that they had in common uh, at a very large rate. They're risk takers. And today I'll be telling you about some risks you ought to be taking. But the reason you're a risk taker is because you're optimistic. You know, I'm a guy who built a gigantic business in this country before I got into politics, before I got into business, before I wrote the number one political book in America, The Ultimate Obama Survival Guide. Before all that, I was the number one Vegas odds maker in the world and had three million clients who paid for my advice on who would win and lose professional football and college football games. So my whole life is about taking risks and always being optimistic and believing that I've got the right the right team, the right stock, the right real estate, the right investment. So I, I think you're in the right place today. And by the way, there was a second Duke business study, a second one that studied people who just graduated from Duke Business School. So these weren't CEOs, these were kids who just got their MBA from Duke. And they found the more positive ones uh, got job offers half, uh, or I say twice as fast, or half as slow. They got bigger salaries and they were promoted within a year at a far higher rate than the ones who were the least optimistic. So whether you're the CEO or whether you're aiming to be the CEO, this is factual proof that you've got to be optimistic in life. You've got to see the glass as half full. You've got to take lemons and make lemonade. That's not to say what's happening isn't bad. It's that you've got to turn it into something good. Or as I say, no matter how bad the economy is, even if we're in a depression, which I think this is an Obama Great Depression, and I'm sure a lot of things I'll say today match with what Peter Schiff said, because him and I think very much alike on things. You can build your own personal booming economy, a great economy for yourself, no matter what's happening in the rest of the world. And that's what I'm talking to you about today. When, when I say glass is half full, what do I mean? Let me give you a perfect example. Two guys land in sub-Saharan Africa. They get off the plane, they're both shoe salesmen. They both look around and all they see is people with no shoes. One of them gets on a cell phone, calls home and says, put me on a flight right back again, there are no customers. And the other guy looks out and says, make the factory work 24 hours a day and empty the warehouse set. Everything you got, there's nothing but customers. Get it? That's the glass is half full. So even with Obama as president, even with a guy that I think is a dedicated Marxist as president of the United States, who hates this country in my opinion, or maybe even a better way to put it, as I did on TV when People were asked running for president, does Obama hate America? They asked Republican candidates. I said the right answer is no, actually he loves America the same way that Castro loves Cuba. He still destroyed it with his love. He made people's lives miserable. He took away everything they could ever own. You don't have a car, you don't have a home, you don't have a business, you live in abject poverty. Your life is misery. But on his deathbed, I'll bet Castro would say he was the greatest Cuban patriot ever and he loved his country. He'd swear it and he'd pass a lie detector test. Obama probably thinks in his mind he loves America. But the things he's doing to America aren't gonna make it better, they're gonna make it worse. 
As a matter of fact, if you look at the Economic Freedom Index, this is the first time in history we've dropped six years in a row, all six years under Obama. And we are now behind countries you'd never imagine. You know, England and Canada have more economic freedom than America. Hong Kong, right at the top. Singapore, right at the top. Australia, right at the top. New Zealand, right at the top. America falling to the bottom. That can't be good because whether you're liberal or conservative, you could look at the countries on the bottom and say, we don't want to be like Afghanistan or Angola, right? Does anyone want to be like Angola? Does anyone want to be like the worst countries in the world with the worst economies, with people living in abject poverty? No. Uh, the other country I like to compare America to is Venezuela. <clears throat> at this very moment, the middle class has been murdered in Venezuela. And that's my new book that's out now, The Murder of the Middle Class. The middle class is in the streets protesting and rioting and dying. There's nothing left but poor people living in abject poverty. But the stock market is at all-time highs in Venezuela. Very similar to the objective of Barack Obama. Make the donors at the very top fabulously rich with printed money, and everybody else, the middle class, is destroyed a little bit more every single day until there's no one left and everyone's dependent on government except that little class at the top that's super rich that either runs a hedge fund or is a Wall Street investment banker or is the CEO of a publicly traded company can write Obama $1 million checks with the Democratic National Committee $1 million checks. If you can only write $500 checks, you're not on his radar. He doesn't care about you. And by the way, for the most part, neither does the Republican Party. And that's the problem with America today. There it is in a nutshell. So, uh, you know, as bad as that sounds, and I'm going to give you a few negative stats now, and then I'll go on to the positive. The negative stats have been in the last three days. I've got these out of the media in the last three days. First of all, Chicago debt has been downgraded to junk bond status. You all hear that? Junk bond status. How's America going to get better when the guy from Chicago with the same philosophy is running America and they're now junk bond? Uh, just today, the Chicago public school system bonds were lowered to junk bond status. Yesterday, it was Chicago itself. Today, it was the school system public school bonds. How about as of yesterday, Hawaii admitted their Obamacare exchange is bankrupt and will be phased out and closed as of February, despite 205 million in federal government subsidies that came from you, the taxpayer. How could Obamacare work in America if it fails even in Obama's Hawaii in a small place with only a million people on it, a little tiny state? April consumer spending, horrible. You heard that, right? Horrible. How could it be horrible when all I heard in the media in November and December was we have the lowest gas prices in decades and this is going to create a windfall for consumers and consumer spending is about to fly. And I went on every interview and said, what a lie. It can't fly because I'm saving 100 bucks on gas while I spend an extra 1000 a month on health insurance, health care costs, and then an extra 300 on higher electricity bills because they're phasing out coal and they think green energy is so great, and an extra 300 at the grocery store because everything that runs on, uh, on anything involving energy, electricity, is now higher. Are your grocery prices lower? Do you feel like there's no inflation? Of course not. Government is lying about every statistic out there. Disastrous. So there is no consumer spending. And the result of the lower consumer spending is they said GDP for the first quarter is going to get downgraded from 0 0.02 to now negative GDP in the first quarter. And they don't expect much better in the second quarter. How about productivity? Negative back-to-back -back quarters for the first time since 1993. How about 40 straight months? with over 46 million people on food stamps. And the only ray of hope was the report of great jobs numbers just a few days ago. Now, how many of you, raise your hand, really believe those were great jobs numbers? Anybody in this room? Be brave, it's okay. Nobody thinks they were great jobs numbers. I have an entire room. So here's why you're right. Out of 223,000 new jobs created, 252,000 were full-time jobs lost, 437,000 are part-time jobs gained. Did anyone tell you that in the media? Did you know that? Was that in the headline? Was that even in the second paragraph? I didn't see it anywhere except on the economic kind of wonk, policy wonk sites that I go to that break down the number. How many of you know that as they announced 230,000 or so, 220,000 or so new jobs, they announced a downward revision from last month of 30% from 126,000 to 85,000. 
So what would make anyone in the media believe that the 220 next month won't be downgraded by 30% as well? What would make anybody believe that? Because every month under Obama, it's the same thing. They give you a big headline number. It's all made up of part-time jobs. Well, they're losing all the full-time jobs because of Obamacare. And then in quiet on the fourth paragraph, they announced that there was a reconfiguration of last month's numbers, and it's always down. Unbelievable. And the media doesn't care. How about the fact that uh, <clears throat> the uh, Federal Reserve Bank surveys in Philadelphia New York and Atlanta all found the exact same thing when they asked employers, and I only saw it in one place, the Wall Street Journal. No other newspaper or media in the country reported it. They asked them in response to Obamacare, would they be hiring people or would they be firing people? Would they be creating full-time or part-time jobs? And in all three places they reported they're not hiring any full-time people, they're hiring only part-time people, and the new added costs of Obamacare are being passed on to their employees. So explain to me why there's no consumer spending. There it is. Explain to me why there's part-time jobs. There it is. You don't need anything else. The Fed's the one telling you, who did they ask? The only people that matter, employers. And then last but not least, how could the media have any integrity and report 223,000 new jobs, but not mention 93,100,000 people are working age out of work, the most in the history of America, all-time record as of the same month that they reported 223,000 new jobs. We're being deceived by the media. It's very scary. They don't tell the truth anymore. They just decide to report whatever the administration tells them to report. So I think it all is happening because of what Groucho Marx once said. Groucho said, politics is the art of looking for trouble, finding it, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies every time. <laughs> and that's what's happening. The problem is too much government, and so the solution you're getting is more government. The problem is debt and spending, and the only solution they have for you is more debt and more spending. The problem is public schools run by teachers unions, and the only solution is, no matter how bad it gets, the answer is we need more money, and they give them more. And then it gets worse, and they need more, and they give them more. The problem is vets dying on waiting lists at the VA, and when they find out about it, heads will roll, and it's the biggest news story in America. And eight months later, what was the end result? Dramatically more spending at the VA and not one single person fired. As a matter of fact, what they used to do spending for, they hired more government employees to keep more people on the waiting list. They'll probably keep track of them on the waiting list. Uh, the problem is healthcare is too expensive, so the answer is government takes it over and they triple the cost. Great solution, right? The problem is Amtrak is a horrible, miserable failure, and so what's the solution when Amtrak crashes and proves it's a horrible, miserable failure and eight people die and 200 are injured? Well, of course, Democrats say, it's your fault you're not spending enough money on Amtrak. It's the same answer every single time. The solution is always more money, even though we're 18 trillion in debt, and that's not using government accounting principles. The real number is 218 trillion in debt. It's unimaginable, and we're never gonna be able to pay it back. The good news is, I'm still happy, I'm still optimistic, I'm still enthusiastic. Because, because we are dysfunctional, and we are addicted to debt, and therefore I've come up with a 12-step program. So here's my 12-step program to capitalize on every idiotic move that Obama makes. And, and by the way, I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek because I don't think anything's idiotic, I don't think he's dumb, I think he's brilliant, he knows exactly what he's doing, and he's killing the country and killing capitalism. So number one is, you know, my new book comes out August 10th, it's called The Power of Relentless, and it's my first business self-help book, no politics, the Power of Relentless, one shameless plug. You can get it pre-order right now at Amazon.com. And so my first rule, my first golden rule of the 12 steps is, is the real golden rule, gold and silver. Because it's the most relentless thing you could ever invest in. Throughout time, throughout millennia, no matter what period you look at, gold does well while the media is telling you to stay away from gold. It's, it's really an amazing thing. Precious metals are the perfect financial instrument uh, you know, for a country that's heavily in debt and going more in debt every single day. Nothing has ever stopped the relentless appreciation of gold or silver for that matter, but I'm a little more of a fan of gold. Presidents haven't stopped it. Countries haven't stopped it. Central banks haven't stopped it. The world's most powerful banking families haven't stopped it. 
The experts on CNBC that have incredible conflicts of interest and hate gold haven't stopped it. Uh, all the people that slander and hate Peter Schiff haven't stopped it, even though Peter and I love gold. You know, Warren Buffett, who slanders gold every opportunity, hasn't stopped it. In the end, gold always wins. Let me prove it to you. Since 1913, 1913, if you had a million dollars in cash, and I picked that year because 1913 is the year the Fed was formed. It's also the year that the income tax was passed in the United States, a really, really bad year. And so from the year 1913 to, 1913 to today, over a hundred year period, if you had a million dollars in cash and you put it in your mattress in 1913, do you know what the buying power is today? It's, it's like right around twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, right in that neighborhood. Okay, it was down 98%, and then gold, uh, the dollar made a little bit of a comeback. So say it's instead of $20,000, it's around $30,000. If you had a million dollars in gold in the year 1913 and kept it till today, it's worth right about $62 million. So the difference between 30,000 and 62 million is the difference in a belief and a faith in the government of America that backs your dollar and a belief in gold that Warren Buffett would say does nothing, earns no interest, doesn't have a job, doesn't run a company, doesn't produce anything. But it does produce something. It produces sound money. It produces safe sleep at night, sound sleep. I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't have a large percentage of what I own in gold. That's how I sleep at night, because there's a lot of bad things that I think could happen, a lot of black swan events. Gold is up 3,500%, 3,500% since 1970. That's take, don't take my word for it, that's the London Telegraph talking. Gold has doubled versus stocks since 1967. Gold has outperformed stocks for 40 years. Why the 40-year demarcation mark? Because up until 1967, gold was pegged to world currencies. Once that ended, when France dropped gold as the gold standard in 1967, gold has outperformed stocks in every single period over the last 50 or so years, except for the tech bubble from 1997 to the year 2000. Overall, since 1967, stocks were up 18.45%. Gold is up 37.43%. Now, since the year 2003, we all know gold has been down. And as my good buddy Benjamin Graham would say, you know, buy low and sell high. I see it as a buying opportunity. I see people as being uh, rather stupid if they believe that gold is not a smart thing to buy. And I know that central banks agree with me. Central banks around the world bought more than $3 trillion of physical gold in the year 2013. And all of that in 2013 followed a record buying spree in 2012 when central banks in that one year bought more gold than in all the years since 1964 combined. How about last year, 2014? Central banks did it again. They wanted a gold buying spree. Well, you're being told by CNBC not to buy gold. Central banks around the world bought 477 tones of gold, 17% more than in 2013, and the second most gold bought in a year in the past half century, only topped by 2012. So why did gold go up so much between 2000 and 2013? Incredible government spending, incredible growth in debt. So here are the facts about debt. It hasn't gotten better since 2000 to 2013. It's gotten much worse. So if you thought gold was great then, then I've got a great gold story for you now. Obama's on track to add 12 trillion to the national debt by the time he leaves office, a staggering three times more than George Bush. The marketable debt of the US government, marketable debt, that's their own uh, catchphrase, has increased by 106% under Obama from 5.7 trillion at the end of January 2009 to 11.8 trillion at the end of January 2014. That's my most updated stat. If the US debt was stacked in dollar bills, it would stretch 1.1 million miles into space, five times the distance from the moon to the earth. The national debt now exceeds the entire output of the US economy. The debt to GDP ratio is now over 100% in America, of which in the history of the world, no country that ever passed 100% debt to GDP ratio has ever recovered. 
The national debt jumped $328 billion in one day under Barack Obama. That's more than the entire budget deficit for the year 2007 under George Bush. Total public and private debt in advanced economies across the globe. So what's important for gold isn't what's happening in America, it's the debt of the world. Total public and private debt is 30% higher now than it was before the Lehman Brothers financial crisis in 2008. So what's gonna happen the next time there's a major crisis, which I feel is gonna happen any day now? We have no bullets left in the gun to fight it, folks. The whole world is completely bankrupt and they've shot every bullet in their gun. Student loans, which is by far the biggest crisis in this country, are on track in two to three years to be double that of all the credit card debt in the United States of America. Because of all this debt, the US credit rating, as I'm sure you know, has been downgraded for the first time in history. No surprise now that you know Chicago's debt has been downgraded to junk bond status. And here's the worst news of all. Think about this. Interest rates are being kept artificially low. They're the lowest in history. Any increase in interest rates in the future would result in just the interest on the debt exploding to levels that would eat up the entire budget of the United States of America and put us into a debt spiral. So the next time someone tells you that the Fed has to raise interest rates and it's going to be soon, I got news for you. They're, they're doing a head fake here. They're like an NFL running back. They keep threatening to raise interest rates, but they can't. They're in a quarter of which there's no return. It may go up, there may be a slight increase sometime soon. Maybe they'll do it by a quarter point. Maybe they'll do a second quarter point. But folks, it can never go back to the interest rates that are even historically low under the Bush administration or the entire budget of America would be destroyed. In January 2001, when George W. Bush took office, the Treasury was paying an average interest rate of 6.6% on its marketable debt. In January 2009, when Obama took office, the Treasury was paying an average interest rate of 3% on its marketable debt. And in January of 2014, the US paid an average interest rate of 1.99% on its marketable debt. So do a little basic math. The average interest rate on the US government's marketable debt is now less than a third of the interest rate we were paying in 2001, even though our marketable debt was only 25% of what we now owe now. If interest rates were to rise up from the historically low rates they're at now, our economy would be destroyed. So interest rates aren't going anywhere, and the answer is gold. It's the only big answer to debt that I know. There's three of them. Gold's the big one. I'm gonna give you two more in a minute. But it's the, here's the most important question that I could ever ask, and, and hopefully you'll understand the answer. If gold rose over 400%, from 2000 to 2013 due to massive debt being accumulated by the US government because of our government's out of control spending, why wouldn't gold and silver be an even better investment moving forward as you just heard those statistics? Anyone who tells you gold is a bad investment is kidding you or head faking you or doesn't know what they're talking about, they're ignorant. So uh, I'm gonna give another plug here because there's only one gold company that I recommend to people, so if you wanna take it down, it's Swiss America. Swiss America, they've been around for 30 years. They're one of the five biggest gold companies in the United States of America. They are reputable, they are credible. The CEO is a best friend of mine, I vouch for them. And uh, if you ever wanna reach them, the website is relentlessgold.com. Relentlessgold.com and the phone number is 800-519-6270. If you're gonna buy gold and you like what I have to say, might as well find a place that you can trust where you get the right price for gold and you know what you're getting. And if they ever give you, a, what's that? Number 800-519-6270. 800-519-6270. And by the way, the other nice thing is if you ever are unsatisfied with anything that happens when you speak to them or any results, you know you can come to me, Wayne Root. My personal email, wayneroot at gmail.com. wayneroot at gmail.com. And I will make sure you are always well taken care of. Okay, number two along with gold. Here's one you're gonna really get a head fake from. You'll go, what? Fancy rare color diamonds. Fancy rare color diamonds. I call them a kissing cousin to precious metals. No one knows about it. Only the richest people in the world understand the value of fancy 
color diamonds. I call them rare fancy color diamonds. But here's just a few stats for you. Since records began in the 1970s, prices for the highest grades of color diamonds have increased in value by about 15% per year. Eight of the 11 most expensive diamonds ever sold at auction at Sotheby's and Christie's are rare, natural, fancy color diamonds. The fancy color diamond index showed a 167% appreciation rate since January of 2005. That compares, that's 167% from 2005 to today. That compares to a 58% increase in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, 63% in the S&P 500, and 82% increase in London real estate prices, just to give you a few things to compare it to. Pink fancy color rare diamonds were up 360% over the last nine years. The highest price ever paid for a color diamond was in 2013 at Sotheby's, a pink color diamond sold for $83.2 million. Research in 2012 showed fancy color diamond prices per carat grew at auctions from 115,000 to 625,000 over a 10 year period, while pink diamonds went up 443%. And there's another aspect to rare diamonds that beats gold. And what's that aspect? If things get bad enough in your country, wherever you might be from, and maybe in our country, if things get bad enough and you want to get on a plane or get in a car and cross a border and get the hell out of town, you can fit a million dollars of diamonds in your little shoe, your sock, your pocket, and it's undetectable on an x-ray machine. Did you know that? Carbon, undetectable on an airport x-ray machine. You can carry a million dollars in a thumbnail. So I think diamonds are pretty interesting, one-two punch to go along with gold. And once again, I've got a company to recommend if you want to take down the information. The diamond market, the only one I would recommend. I don't put my name on very many things. I put it on three things, gold, diamonds, and oil. Those are the three I believe are the answers to what's coming in this country. And I'll give you the places to go in all three. The diamond market, the website is thediamondmarket.com. Thediamondmarket.com. And the phone number is 877-432-6291. Phone number again, 877-432-6291. Why do I do this? Because if I'm going to give you advice, I want you to go to the right place where I think you'll be well taken care of. And again, if you're not, you just come to me and I'm the ultimate guy to hold everyone responsible to do the right thing. WayneRoot at gmail.com. All right, oil and gas, number three. Now, listen. They're not making any more oil, they're not making any more gold, they're not making any more diamonds, it's in the ground, you gotta go get it. These are things that have finite. There's a finite amount of them, and so they're precious and they're valuable. The entire economy of the world runs on fossil fuel. So all the liberal green energy geeks can tell you anything they want, but in the end, we need fossil fuel, and it's always going to be valuable. Green energy is a gigantic failure. It's a pipe dream. It's not working, and the reason why is it's too expensive. I have nothing against solar energy. I have nothing against wind energy. I have nothing against an electric car. In the end, I wish they'd work, and I'd be part of it. But they don't work because they're too expensive, and that's why no one's buying. That's why nobody wants a Chevy Volt. The reason why is if we converted the whole world to green energy and stopped using dirty fossil fuel, you'd pay $300 for a slice of pizza. Your home electric bill would be $3,000 a month. It doesn't work. What's my proof? Spain. Spain reconfigured their entire economy in the year 2000. Their entire economy to become the green energy capital of Europe. But nobody ever tells you that, do they? That's why Spain is the most bankrupt country in the entire Europe. The people are penniless. The people are scrounging in the streets for sandwiches and dumpsters. Spain's houses on the beach are worth nothing. Spain's retirement funds are gone. The country's so broke, no one would buy a Spanish bond. So the country said, we have to keep the bond prices propped up. So let's take all of your retirement accounts and buy your bonds. So the people of Spain's retirement accounts have been used to buy the bonds that are worthless. And why is the unemployment rate 27%, the reported unemployment rate in Spain, and for youths under the age of 25, 56%? Because green energy kills jobs. There was a libertarian think tank that studied the Spanish economy. 
and they found for every one job created by green energy, two and a half jobs in the traditional economy are killed. That's why green energy can't work. It doesn't work. It kills jobs and it raises prices to an unaffordable level. So for years, I gave everyone the following advice. Go out and buy energy stocks. Go out and buy oil stocks. Because while other people are complaining as they put the gas in the pump, you're cheering every time it goes up. You know, every time you spend an extra $5 at the pump, you made an extra 5000 in the stock market. I've always believed that. Go buy ExxonMobil. But I found something better. I found something better. So much better, I put my name on it, became spokesman of the company. It's called Black Gold Resources, and it's an oil drilling company. And they don't drill in the beginning where all the risk is and you might hit a dry well. They take wells that have already been drilled and they go in and clean them up, they buy them, they use the latest technology, and all the major lifting and work's been done, all the major expenses are out of the way, and Black Gold takes over those oil wells. And what I found out was if I put 100,000 into a stock, like Exxon Mobil, I don't get anything back this year, right, unless the stock goes up, but the US government doesn't usually give money away. They do in the case of oil drilling. If you invest 100,000, just as a figure, could be 10,000 or could be a million, but if you invest 100,000 in an oil drilling well investment with black gold resources, you get an 85% tax deduction write-off in the first year before you've ever made one penny. This is not some scam, some get-rich-quick scheme. This is the U.S. government encouraging you to invest in oil drilling. It's been around for many years. 85% write-off in your first year, so you take 85,000 deduction on your taxes before the well even delivers. The five-year ROI is up to 50% in year one, not including tax savings. Excuse me, the first-year ROI is up to 50% in year one, not including tax savings. There is zero drilling risk, and by adding residual income plus tax savings, the potential return on investment could exceed six to one with 30 years of income possible in each well. And you can use your IRA. So while Obama and his socialist cabal are complaining about dirty fossil fuels, you are cleaning up. I like to say dirty is the new clean. <laughs> so you can contact Black Gold Resources at 800 oil 9505 800 oil 9505 or mark haynes is their director of marketing and he happens to be standing in this room right in the back mark you back there i have lousy eyes but i know you're back there somewhere he should be if he's not over here all right we got him okay hey mark there he is mark haynes of black gold resources mark wave your hand someone just looked and they don't know where you are there you are but the phone number again 800 oil 9505. Okay, so the top three for me, gold and silver, meaning precious metals, diamonds, but only rare, fancy color diamonds, because the kind you put on your wife's hand when you say, I love you for life, let's get married, that's like a car. You drive out the showroom and it's worth half, like a car is, the minute you drive away or walk away. So you don't want regular diamonds, that's what I'm talking about. Fancy, rare, color diamonds only, and of course, invest in oil drilling. Those are the three that help you to achieve success if this economy goes to hell in a handbasket. Now let me tell you all my other ideas. There's a few others. And how are we doing with time? What's our timing now? About nine, nine minutes? Okay. Number four is buy a home. I'm still a big fan of real estate, but only in tax-free states. Because the future of America, if you know what taxes are like in New York, or California, or New Jersey, or Connecticut, or Illinois. You know, here's my story. I lived my whole life, born and raised in New York, lived there till I was 27 years old, then moved to the beach in Malibu, became a CNBC anchorman, hosted five shows on CNBC, and then went into business and did real well for myself, and bought a mansion on the beach in Malibu, lived there 13 years, and then the last 13 years, I moved here, and I live on a beautiful golf course overlooking five lakes and seven waterfalls here in Las Vegas called Anthem Country Club, with a view of lakes, waterfalls, the mountains, the green golf course, and the entire Vegas Strip at night laid out in front of me, and I love it. And what's amazing about living in a tax-free state is, the money I save in taxes pays my mortgage. So you get a mansion for free, for free. They don't give money away in this country very often, but you get a mansion for free when you move to a 
a Nevada or a state of Washington or a state of Texas or a state of Florida, all of which have zero state income tax. So explain to me why anybody would want to live in a high tax state. It makes no sense. You got to get out of Dodge if you live in California or New Jersey or New York. It isn't just getting a mansion free. It's the reason my daughter went to Harvard is she was homeschooled those whole 13 years. And we hired the best teachers in all the country that we could find to come to her house and conduct school classes in my house each day, including college professors. How do we afford that? It was paid for by the taxes I didn't pay by leaving California. I wouldn't have had the money to do that. So I would say you make enough money to either buy a mansion or, or to homeschool your kids or send your kids to private school and there's usually enough left over to eat out at the best restaurants in the world every night on the Vegas Strip. So I would never in my lifetime, you know, I was offered a lot of money, I won't say which TV network, but I've been offered my own political talk show if I moved to California. And I said, you know the money I would lose based on the salary you offered me, paying 13.4% state income tax versus zero on all of my income, not just the income I'm gonna get for the TV show, on everything I do now, I would lose money by taking the TV show and having a national TV show. And I said, I won't leave Nevada. Either you build a studio here and we do it from Nevada or I just won't be on TV, that's life. But I'm not paying that kind of money. You gotta be crazy to give the government that piece of your life, crazy. And, and not only that, but how about the expenses of living in these places? My buddy called me the other night. He has a 1,500 square foot apartment in Greenwich Village, 1,500. And the house is worth $4,000 per square foot. That's $6 million. I have another buddy that just bought a 3,000 square foot home in Los Angeles for $3.8 million. You could have an 8,000 square foot mansion in Las Vegas for like a million five. I mean, this is the greatest bargain in the world and pay no taxes and your mortgage is free. How about real estate investment property? The only place that people are gonna move in the future because you can't afford it anymore if you pay the taxes this country wants. They're gonna move to Nevada, they're gonna move to Texas, they're gonna move to Florida, they're gonna move to Wyoming, they're gonna move to Washington, they're gonna move to South Dakota. And, and the West Coast, a few states that are low tax, not zero tax, but they may move to Arizona, Colorado, or Utah. And I would have rental properties in all those places but they're all gonna leave California and they're gonna move somewhere where it's cheaper and the taxes are lower. So investment properties outside of high tax states. Number five is stocks. Let me, there's a lot of people who think the market's gonna crash. And I don't know what Peter said. Was Peter Schiff very down on the stock market? Because I'm very down on it long term. But short term, believe me when I tell you, the economy is so bad that we will not survive unless they do QE4, QE5, QE6, and QE800. They are never going to be able to stop the bond purchase and the bond repurchase and the buybacks. There's no way to stop. This country won't survive, this economy won't survive, and the stock market wouldn't survive. And every time you have QE, the market goes up, 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 up. So in the short term, I think stocks are going to continue to go up for a while. It's just, I think it's smart to own certain kinds of stocks. And once again, I think contrarian and different than the rest of the world. I would own coal stocks. I think it's a great spot, I'm a contrarian. The moment something's at the bottom, that's when you wanna buy it. When something's at the top, that's when you wanna sell it. So there's a coal ETF. I don't make any money on recommending it. It's called, uh, the letters are KOL. And it's a great coal ETF, and it pays a 2.5% dividend. It's got nowhere to go but up, it's at the low. It's the time to buy. I would buy buying gold mining stocks with both fists. They're at all time lows, ridiculous lows, so low that you can't even afford to produce the gold in the mine anymore. Doesn't make any sense. It's got nowhere to go but up. That's how Benjamin Graham became the most successful stock investor in the history of Wall Street. You buy when no one else wants it. I'd also buy what uh, my friend Jim Rogers would recommend. Farmland, agriculture, water, timber, grazing, firearms and ammunition stocks because the greatest gun salesman in the history of the world is my friend Barack Obama. Never been a greater gun salesman. Private security, there will be more and more Baltimores. You want to invest in companies that provide security. Domestic terrorism protection, you know, with Obama as president and maybe into the future with anyone else, we are the number one target other than Israel and there will be terrorism and the threat will be there forever and the government will spend so much money, it will continue to bankrupt this country, but you can make money on companies that are involved with domestic terrorism protection. Me, I've never smoked pot in my life. I would buy public marijuana cannabis companies. Why? Because look at the results in Colorado. You legalize marijuana and people want it. 
And so I think it's a great opportunity now. It can only go up. And national defense. Why national defense? Because of Obama, we're the weakest we've ever been, and we're in trouble all around the world, and wars could break out at any moment, anywhere and everywhere in the world, and we're going to need to spend more on national defense, not less. Number six, Chinese stocks. But not all Chinese stocks, because China is a big Ponzi scheme waiting to blow up too. You know what stocks? I'm a Jewish kid. And all my parents ever said to me day and night from the day I was born is you're going to Columbia University, you're going to Columbia University, you're going to Columbia University. And I went to Columbia University and my sister went to Columbia University. Education was the only thing they ever talked about. All they talk about in China is going to the best college and getting out of this poverty-stricken village. The Chinese are like the Jews. Education, education, education. They'll spend any amount of money on educating their children. Matter of fact, more than any Jew will ever spend. The Chinese are amazing. And so I would invest in Chinese education stocks. And there are six of them publicly traded on the NASDAQ stock exchange. You look them up. I can tell them to you now, we're running out of time. Six Chinese education companies publicly traded. How about a great stock newsletter? And I have no interest in it. I've been following it and using it for many years now. VRAletter.com. V as in Victor, R as in Robert, A as in Andrew, letter, L-E-T-T-E-R. VRAletter.com run by an investment guru by the name of Kip Herridge, who I think is the best I have ever seen. VRAletter.com. How about ownership? Always own. Whether you own your business, whether you own your home, or whether you own your kid's future with private school or charter school or homeschooling, everything is about ownership. They can't take it away from you. No one's gonna take your home away from you. No one's gonna take your business away from you. No one's gonna take your kid's future away from you unless you stick them in a public school where they get dumbed down and brainwashed. Everything with me is about ownership. That's how you beat the people that are in charge. Great, five minutes, got it. Uh, number nine is in particular homeschooling, which I believe is the future of education in the United States of America. Number 10, guns and lead. Make sure you're well armed. There is going to be unrest in this country and it's gonna get really, really bad. And number 11 is ownership of your body. I take 100 vitamin pills a day. I gotta stay healthy. I gotta stay relentless, because it is tougher than it's ever been, and the competition is tougher than it's ever been, and I gotta stay healthy. So I work out every day, I eat healthy, I try and eat about half organic or so, except when I'm on the strip in Las Vegas enjoying a steak, and I try and take a lot of vitamin pills, and that's, my 12-step program, because we're running out of time. Thank you, everyone. God bless you.